Okay, hello everyone. Welcome again to another sun Sunday Axia after our stream. It's been a week already. I feel like I just did the last one yesterday. Time goes by very quickly. How are you all doing? John B and Peter Green, always the first ones out the gate. How are you guys doing? Always the first ones in. It's good to see you, Morgan, as well. Very familiar faces now. Good to see you guys. Hope you've all had a great week and a very fast one. Here we go, a few more guys. Good, thank you guys. Yeah, no, I'm doing fine. Uh, so we'll wait just a few more minutes just for people to trickle in. But as you might have guessed already, is uh, judging by what you can see right next to me, we're going to be doing everything on, well, not everything. In fact, we're going to do a very, very streamlined, optimized uh, bond, sort of bond fundamentals, bond market fundamentals, covering all that side. And I'll explain the reasons why we. I'm going to go through it because I feel it's very, obviously, a very important topic. And uh, a few guys, few of you guys also wanted to know. So here we go. Hope you guys are doing fine. I see uh, Argentina. I was actually going to ask uh, if there's anyone watching from the very far, uh, even further uh, down the time zone, something like, um, I don't know, Pacific time, California, maybe Hawaii, if it's midday or what time is it then? Midday or maybe even late morning for you guys. I don't know if we have any viewers from there, but if you are from there, let me know. Cool. Okay. Okay, so what's the time? Let's see. O oh, three. See Canada. Yeah, the the Canadians always come out in force. They're very consistent guys. It's very nice. Good to see you guys. Birmingham, I see. Oh, we have the Pacific. Okay, Pacific time, eleven a.m. Cool. So then I can also say uh, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to everyone. Cool. So, okay. So let's get this show on the road, guys. Um, bear with me two seconds because I feel like we've I've switched around a lot of the software recently and computers and everything. So I'm a bit uh, debilitated on where everything is. But uh, no, that should be fine. Let's. Um, yeah, Satoshi said he's he's in the house now. So let's uh, let's just get going. Cool. So <clears throat> before we get into that, there's a few questions here. I think uh, for John from John B, uh, Hyten or Hinton and and Flo. And a few, I think a few of you guys as well from the, um, from the, uh, um, you know, from the questions that you guys want to know a bit more fundamentals on bonds, bond market, bond pricing and all that. And I feel it's a very important topic, you know, especially when we have a lot of the young guys coming in and, uh, you know, they're a bit more, shall we say, like, um, you know, not very clear on a lot of the bond topics. And I feel like it's a topic which is once you understand bonds intuitively, it doesn't have to be a very com complicated topic. And this is actually the big thing I'm going to go through now. Because uh, okay, there's a few guys here from North Korea. So uh, thanks for thanks for uh, showing up as well, guys. It must be difficult to connect from there, but uh, that's good. But anyway, <clears throat> so bonds, yes. There's nothing very, um, you know, um, it can be very intuitive as well. And once you understand the first principles, the basics and whatever, you can pretty much figure everything else out which is actually hopefully what I'm going to try and get through today because I'm not going to make this, you know, some three hour boring lecture of something crazy because we're not here as academics to, you know, talk about crazy cash market, bullet bonds, calculations, whatever. No one cares, or at least we don't care. And at the same time, we're not here as like, you know, corporate bond traders at some emerging market uh, OTC desk or something. We're, we, I want to look at it from the perspective as intraday futures, um, flow traders okay and because of that when i was actually going through this in my head guys when i was discussing how am i going to present this it was actually really difficult to even think of how to simplify it to bare bones and how to actually get through something useful to you guys in the time we have uh, so that was actually the most difficult part so i hope i'm going to do this part justice and because of that i'm going to oversimplify perhaps some parts i'll say when i'm oversimplifying so don't think that's you know there's nothing else there i will oversimplify i'll cut corners slightly that's just to make it a bit more efficient and also for, um, you know, to um, uh, sort of create this mental model, these shortcuts you must have in your head when you're trading flow or when you're trading news 
and you need to think through things very quickly. So I'll, I'll explain all of that as we go along. So if there's any sort of CFA level candidate three here who knows all about crazy cash bonds or whatever, um, be prepared because I will cut corners. But uh, I, I think our audience is a bit more, let's say, futures uh, down in the trenches kind of guys. So I think we're all on the same page here. But before I get into that, guys, one thing I want to really point out is a really cool, a really cool, I hope you can see this here. Yeah, I see someone wants to know about more about black schools. So uh, we'll see. I want to point out here a very interesting blog by a first time blog poster by Joe. If any of you guys have been following the uh, sort of the Axie development, you know, Joe is one of the youngest traders really, you know, went from uh, you know, being very consistent to, to increasing his size, his firepower in the market to a very, very, very huge number. And, you know, he had that exponential growth curve, uh, you know, at Axia. So I feel like there's a lot of weight behind what he's going to say in this blog uh, here. And if I can just find my chat, I think I've lost it. I will post the, the link for you guys because I really want you guys to read that sort of like, um, there you go, the link, uh, sort of the you know, coming from a guy who's seen the ups and downs, the real firepower, you know, behind his behind his learning. So I feel like there's a lot of lessons in here. And I really want everyone to read that because I think there's a lot of takeaways in understanding, you know, um, his, his, his deep dive into that. So for, if you guys read that, that'll be really, really cool. And um, and yeah, so uh, let me just put this back neatly so nothing blows up on me. Cool. Got the chat back. And as always, guys, I'd really like to point out for anyone who may be joining first time, first time viewers, I really recommend that you guys go to this link up here, elitetraderworkshop.com. Anything we talk about, fundamentals, uh, how to tie things together, the glue and the tools we use, really check out this free training workshop from someone in the team. It's a really great event. So make sure you please click on that for the first time, guys. Anyway, so let's get this uh, show on the road. As uh, Vladimir says, we're all knuckleheads that are trying to buy the high and sell the low. Well, of course, I mean, that's why we're here. So cool. Anyway, so I'm going to try and keep this as sort of maths free, as, as intuitive as I can make it. So you can really sort of understand it. Um, perhaps the only little tiny bit of maths. Okay. Even if we're all knuckleheads, we can probably understand some of the maths um, in this. And then I'll promise we're going to get very intuitive a bit more later on. Um, for, for Stephen asking, am I in the risk manager's office? Yes, I am. I'm in the Axie office at the moment. So um, there we are. Okay, so let's get the old uh, the old tablet and the old pen uh, fired up. Okay, so let's really oversimplify this right now and talk about any generic bond. Okay, so for those of you who you know, let, let's just go through the bare bonds. So bond is base a bond is basically a borrowing instrument, a, a lender when you're lending money or borrowing money, depending which counterpart you are between two participants. And between those two bond, bond markets, you can summarize them as the corporate bond market and the sovereign bond market in terms of government borrowing. Okay. So basically, as everyone likes to describe it in their finance textbooks 101, it's an IOU at later time and date. But I hope by just constructing these uh, few things here, as I said, I'll keep it jargon free, but hopefully by, by constructing these th things here, you can understand what a bond is. Okay, so <clears throat> we're gonna be looking obviously purely at sovereign bonds, but in this case, we're looking at just, in, in the example I'm about to give you, we're looking just at very generic, um, just a generic bond and it's an oversimplified, okay? So we're not talking about crazy uh, coupon payout structures or anything, we're just talking about an oversimplified uh, bond, just a generic bond, okay. So a bond will come with a nominal value which is also known as the par value. Uh, this, let's see here, will this work? Par value. So um, <clears throat> um, I see if you guys are trying to humor me in the chat, so we'll, we'll discuss that in a second. But uh, anyway, let, let's really focus here for a few minutes and I'll get back to, we'll do Q and A uh, every so often. So the, the par value, so that's really a nominal value. And I think for the treasury uh, notes, the T notes, and I'll keep this very US based because I know you guys are more like um, that side of the world. But this really applies to any sovereign bonds. And I think the T notes really have a thousand dollar nominal value. Let's say that. Okay. It can be any number as ju it just most of the market decided to transform these numbers. Usually you'd find a thousand nominal value, par value or a hundred. Okay. So that is the sort of the, the starting off price, shall we say. That's what bonds are priced at before they go to be auctioned off 
into, you know, through a primary dealer and the secondary market. So that's like their starting value, let's say. But that, that's a nominal value, it can really be anything. But in our example, let's just use a thousand. Okay. And two other features unique to bonds, or shall we say that, you know, it's very deterministic of bonds is the maturity. So how long do you borrow uh, money or how, how long do you um, lend money? And these maturities can go anything from one month all the way up to uh, 30 years, 40 years. And if you ask the Austrian government as well, they are lending out now to 100 years. Okay, so that is the maturity, the length of time the bond will be active in paying you out in terms of um, in, in terms of that money. And usually these payouts occur, um, you know, so, so you, 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 let's say you buy the bond, you lend the money to the person selling you the bond, okay? And that when this maturity, uh, you know, um, uh, finishes, when you, you know, when you get the money, you get the money back at whatever maturity. And in that case, let me just move my, let me just move my thing here. That maturity can be anything from, the, you know, in terms of like, um, if we're talking about like uh, T-bills, anything from like one month to, uh, you know, something like 20 years, um, anything to, and then plus, and then, you know, something, some crazy uh, cash bonds have like 100 years. And uh, we'll talk more about that later in terms of the yield curve and everything. But that's the maturity. And that's when you get all of your money back, plus the uh, sort of interest added on top. And how much of that you get added on top is something called the coupon. Okay, so the coupon is saying, uh, let's say, let's say that is 2%, which means that you'll get paid 2% annually, the value of 2% uh, of the par value of the bond. And here I'm talking about more about the cash bond guys, because that is the underlying uh, product we are, that, that is the underlying, of course, we're trading the futures, the derivative of the cash, and I'll explain the difference in a bit, but just so we understand the underlying we're trading as we should if we're trading derivatives. Okay, so so basically, if you were to buy that bond, you know, you buy it for this price and uh, th that bond will pay you out 2% in that case. So let's say uh, $20 every year. Okay, I was going to draw uh, pounds, GBP, let's say $20. Okay, it depends on the bond. Some bonds pay you out, uh, you know, quarterly or uh, biannually or whatever, but uh, usually biannually, I think in terms of the T-notes. In any case, you get those $20 every single time um, you know, let's say every year up to 20 years, every year up to 30 years, or every year up to 100 years or whatever. Uh, the, 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 the short, the very short, you know, uh, ones like the T-bills, uh, they don't really pay out the coupon. They pay you something like discount to par, but I, I won't really go into that right now uh, today. Okay. And as, as Vladimir says, generational wealth, wealth in those 100 year bonds. Anyway, so that is the... <clears throat> the coupon that they can be sold for. And this coupon can obviously change. And I'll explain how that changes based on the interest rates. So the three, the, the, the three basic components of the bonds is understanding the par value. Just, I don't want to say a random number. It's not exactly random, but just a number that's chosen to just price these when we start off, when the bond is going to be auctioned and entering into the market, okay? And then the maturity of how long that bond is active in paying the, the, the uh, owner or the holder of that bond out. And the coupon is how much of the par value is being paid. Okay, so as I said, if it's two percent on the thousand, it's going to be twenty dollars, uh, and it's going to pay you out every single year. Okay, so <clears throat> um, where am I? Uh, uh, let's let's feed into this uh, section here. In any case, the thing you should always understand is this is these are the values that are locked in. So let's say the owner. Let, let's say the owner of this bond locks in this coupon and holds that bond. Let's, let's say we're talking about a 10-year bond, okay? So we have ourselves a 10-year uh, note uh, in the US and uh, it has a par value of 1,000 and that's, it's at 2%. So it's, it's, um, you know, it's, it's paying you out coupon uh, $20 uh, for those every year for 10 years. And at the end of those 10 years, the, the amount of 10-year notes you buy back, you're going to be given uh, back to you at the end of those 10 years through redemptions by the US government, okay, so, or whoever you're buying the bonds from. Okay, so, and in this case, this is how we can summarize this next bit, the yield, okay, so, <clears throat> and obviously the yields has been a crazy hot topic recently uh, uh, for very, very various reasons, and hopefully, uh, you know, the yield curve and all, and all that uh, kind of stuff, I'm gonna be discussing with perhaps Alex, you know, the co-founder of Axia, he's got a lot to say about this. He has a lot of experience talking about this. He's been trading, you know, since like 2002. 
and he has a lot to say you know on how frothy and how agitated the markets can get on that side so i'll leave it to him to really discuss that in depth we're gonna talk about the basics so you guys can understand that conversation a lot more in depth but we're, i'm just gonna mention it here okay so uh the the yield we can basically derive as and this is the maths bit the uh coupon divided by uh the market value okay so let's call it market value that you know the current price is trading at okay so <clears throat> and then times 100 because we're talking about uh, percentages okay so let's say we're talking about um uh let's say this so let, let's say you've bought this bond up here i hope all you guys can i'm not obscuring anything on the on the chart but i don't think i am so let's say okay so let's say you've bought this bond up here and now this bond has now gone to the secondary market and is trading okay and while that bond is trading it's its price now has is moving up and down just like any instrument okay it has a current market price and i'm going to be spending a lot of this uh you know the stream discussing what influences the bond price okay so that that goes up and down like any instrument and that's the market value here and what you should always remember regardless of what's happening the coupon of that bond will never ever change for the lifetime of that bond okay so if that bond if that coupon from when it was first conceived it's at 2% um of of the of the par value it'll always be at for example twenty dollars so then you do you know 20 divided by a current market price let's say the current market price has gone down to 900 from a thousand which using that maths gives you somewhere between 2.2 percent uh yield okay so that's the current yield of the market okay of, of that bond judged by the market at hand and, and now we're saying to ourselves, <clears throat> well, okay, the coupon doesn't change. Okay, so what actually changes to derive the yield? Okay, well, what changes is actually the current market price. And this is where we uh, can now talk about, if I'm not obscuring this, we can now talk about the relationship between yield and the bond price. Okay. And what you should guys remember, if you again, if we're talking about the modality, you know, uh, mental models or like you know, thinking quickly through things, the yield is always inverse to the bond price. Just remember that. If if you forget about, if you you know, if you get confused about par values and coupons, or whatever, what will be most useful to you as intraday flow traders is just remembering the yield is inverse to the bond price, as you can see the reason uh, uh, because of this calculation. Um, I don't, you can't see my mouse in this, but the calculation here. Okay, so, and, uh, you know, and, and that's how you, and, and that's how you derive the yield, so it's inverse. Cool. Now, let's say what happens if the current market value drops from 900 to, so the coupon always stays the same, to, let's say something cataclysmic happens, it drops to 400, okay, gigantic move, you know, unlike you'll see that in a lot of, um, sort of, you know, uh, uh, high credit worthy country bonds, but I'm just taking exa uh, an extreme example so you can see the the, the um, yield uh, changes and that will give us obviously 5%. So you can see that when the bond price drops, okay, uh, the yield goes up. Or if the bond price goes uh, goes up again, let's say up to 900, then the yields, yields drop. And remember, everyone here, if you've been trading the ZN or the ZB or whatever, uh, you know, the futures, you're always dealing with the bond price. You're not dealing with the yield. So just remember uh, to not get confused which way around. You're always trading the bond price, uh, not the yield. Of, you are trading, obviously, in a sense, the yield. But uh, the, the way the bond comes up on your lander is the price, not the yield. Okay. But they're, they're joint at the hip, um, you know, uh, and so on. And really, a lot of the um, a lot of the, you know, professional uh, pension funds, uh, money market funds, whatever, literally anyone funds, uh, all really think in yields. Okay, they think about how can we capture a certain amount of yields. We have a, a prerogative to to lock in certain yields, um, you know, especially the pension funds, you know, for our clients. And so they can act very mechanically when we get to a very big yield level, which, which is why things happen quite interesting there. Okay. So... <clears throat> um, but us as futures traders, we're concerned more about the bond price, okay? And, and let's just look what's down here. So hopefully I've I've addressed now the maturity. We have bonds, everything from one month to, you know, 20, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, uh, two years, five years, whatever. The par value is just the value that the bond starts off at before it's auctioned off. 
and then the coupon is just a starting it is it's it's you know it's it's locked in for the duration of that uh, of that bond and then the current market price and the yields uh change okay so let me am i not obscuring anything uh, let me see okay so very very intuitively guys without really digging into a lot of maths here what are we going to be talking about so if we have as i described our uh, if I, let's say, let's say this is your 10-year bond that you bought, you bought it at par value of $1,000 and it's paying you out 2% uh, coupon or as in pays you out $20 uh, per, you know, per uh, note that you bought. Uh, sorry, not percent, uh, $20 there. Um, and you bought it. Okay, so we, now the interest rates that the market, you know, uh, has deemed uh, or the, the interest rates are trading at or, or the Fed funds rate, shall we say, is trading at. Uh, they're all linked, and, I, and I'll break those down between Fed funds rate and the, in, and the yield curve, and you know the different uh, rates at different parts of the curve. But okay, let's just say the ger general interest rates we're trading at is two percent. I, I don't want to overcomplicate this for, for those guys who are like super brand new to this. Okay, uh, Satoshi, yes, the yields can be found on the chart, and a lot of um, uh, you know a lot of the time when you do read news, uh, they often talk about yields rather than bond prices, and they often have. Um, uh, yield uh, bonds when they show the bond uh, changes they show in, in terms of yield changes okay so uh, let, okay let's say generically we're trading at two percent and this is why uh, you know this is why if let's say rates so if intuitively let's say rates go up to five percent okay what happens to the bond price well think about it now if you have bought this bond and if you hold that bond all the way for those 10 years, you will be paid back uh, exactly what you lo loaned. Plus, obviously, how however many, um, you know, you you've been paid out every year. But let's say you want to let's say you want to go to the market and you, you can't hold that bond anymore for 10 years and you have to go to the market and sell it at the current price. And what happens to, uh, you know, if we're now dealing with an interest rate environment of 5 percent, what happens because you bought that bond at 2 percent? And here's a clue. You now have to compete with new bonds, new coupons at 5%. Okay, so new bonds coming into the market right now, right? Let's say uh, you bought this uh, bond and now uh, four years has passed, okay, and uh, rates are now 5%. So what happens now? So you're competing with bonds uh, that are being auctioned off right now today and they will have a higher coupon. Okay, those bonds will have a coupon at 5%. So no one is going to want to buy a, a bond of you at, higher, at, at the same price as a bond at 5% coupon when they can only get 2% coupon from you, if that makes sense. Okay, so you're, you're trying to sell a, a, a less valuable product to them theoretically at the same price. So no one's going to do that. They're just going to take the 5% coupon bond because it pays, pays out a higher rate. So what that means is you have to now discount your bond well enough, it has to be cheap enough to, to make it worthy for people to buy it from you. Okay, so the bond price in this case has to go down. You have to sell it at a lower value because you're now competing with new bonds coming in at 5%. Okay, and I think, judging from the chat, I think you guys hit it bang on. Um, price drops, uh, price down. Yes, I think you're all from all I see. All I see is, yeah, you guys are completely 100% bang on. That's correct. So, let's say the rates in an alternative universe you bought the same bond and four years from now the rates are actually at one percent and remember your coupon at two percent has not changed okay you are still you're still taking in you're still receiving this from the u.s government every time so what happens to your bond price let's say you want to get rid of your bond and new bonds coming into the market are only giving out one percent coupon but you're coming in with a bond now that i can actually pay you two percent so you're coming in with a much better product than the market can uh, than the market can give you right now. So what do you think happens to the bond price? What can you market? At what price do you market that bond? Do you hire? Do you sell it at a higher price or at a lower price? What do you guys think? Though I, I gave it away by probably being the opposite of premium price. And oh, yes, that's correct. Premium price so the bond price increases bond price rises okay so that's a bit of an intuitive without going into a lot of maths that just tells you the fact of just remember this the cash the cash bond is always locked in at this percentage and now you're always thinking how how can it compete with the current interest rate environment 
uh, with new bonds coming in onto the market. Okay, so always be thinking what happens with the, with the new market environment, uh, depending when that bond was uh, sold. So you, all of you guys right now are on bang on the money. The bond, uh, um, the, the 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 rates rise. Cool. Uh, if I now just very quickly pull up, okay. Uh, no, that's fine. We'll, we'll leave that for for now. Okay, cool. So you you may have seen. I may have just given the what the next thing is. Cool. So now we've talked about how that bond uh, prices up and down. Okay. So one thing. We, so we've talked more about now uh, these things here. The par value, kind of. We understand kind of the coupons, and we understand the yield. So. And again, I'm going to talk more about what actually causes the the price, the bond prices, other than what we just discussed to go down. But now let's just talk a bit more about maturity. Okay, so if we plot a graph of, will this come in? Yes. Can't draw a straight line. Okay, that's better. So if we plot now a graph of yield and uh, maturity or duration. Ballistic to maturity. What you'll have is, and let's say, let's keep it simple. There's more obviously maturities than this, but let's keep it simple. You have the two year here, you have the five year, you have the 10. Okay, it's not to scale, but like, let's just say it's the 10, uh, the 30, and then whatever plus. Okay. And I'm not going to put on the specific yield, but let's just put on various random numbers, uh, you know, higher numbers. Uh, plus here and on, on in a normal environment in a normal economy or you know normal yield curve it will be sort of in this situation here um, if I draw it like this it will pretty much go like like this okay that's not actually it's it's a bit flatter towards the end so again maybe I'm just terrible at drawing it's not going to be this steep or perhaps in some market environments but generally it'll just be in this sort of shape if I, if I maybe redraw it like this in any case so that's what you call the yield curve Purely where you plot and just see, for example, the two year is, uh, you know, at a certain price, um, the 10 year and the 30 year. Uh, if I remember just off the top of my head, I think last week pre FOMC, we were trading at 1.7, if I'm roughly around there in the 10 year. Okay, uh, last year, you guys can look it up for me if you can. Uh, and as Vladimir said, the, the, uh, the Russian 10 years trading at 7% rate, uh, which is quite low for a, for a country that defaulted not too long ago in the 90s uh, on sovereign bonds. But anyway, that's another matter to discuss considering the Greek uh, bonds are also trading, uh, I think, at a smaller yield relative to the US 10-year. And we're going to discuss why that is all strange right now. Anyway, cool. So that is what you describe as a yield curve. Okay, guys, so it's nothing very scary. It's nothing very complicated. Okay, I'm just going to... Let me just let me just redraw this because I, I don't like that curve. I'm probably going to mess it up again. But anyway... Here we go. So let's draw it like this. So that's just the yield curve, okay? And and uh, the yield curve, guys, is always shifting. So every time you would watch a ladder going up and down, up and down in the day, this yield curve is always shifting, okay? And what you'll always have most of the time are actually parallel shifts, okay? So if we would describe, for example, um, if we if we talk about you know the short end or the long end or whatever going up and down. Yes, they do, but it's a relative move. But a lot of the time, the, the yield curve is actually parallel shifting, where you may have the you know parallel shift uh, higher and a parallel shift lower or whatever. But the interesting thing for us really is a relative shift in what we would call the short end. So anything below this way in this direction, okay? Anything we would call in the belly. And anything you'd call in the long end, so in this direction here, so 10, uh, 30s, and so on. So this is what we mean when people talk about, you know, I trade the short end, I trade the long end, or whatever. And the way the market trades, the way the market, the, the curve moves from the short end relative to the long end is what we would describe as the yield curve steepening or the yield curve um, flattening. Okay, so, and very, and very exactly what the words describe, literally. Um, if the relative shift in the yield curve is much higher in the long end. So let me use another color here. If this, this is going to look ugly again, but just for a point of point of making it obvious, if the yield, if the long end uh, yield curve uh, shifts higher at higher prices, what you'll have is steepening. If it's if it if it moves more relative to the short end, right? 
because obviously the, the, it, the, the gradient has just become steeper. Okay, so it's a relative move. Relative changes is what we talk about. And this is why there's a whole, whole traders, whole industry in trading the relative value between different bonds, between different co countries in, in the bond space. So that's a whole different like, you know, ball game environment and, and so on. And here we also have, of course, if we, let's say we are now back to our white line here, our normal line, if the, long, if the short end uh, moves higher, uh, you know, it moves more relative to the long end, then you would have a, a, um, a uh, uh, let's say we move here, relative to the long end, then we would have a flatter curve, okay? So that's what we mean about uh, steepening and flattening and, and all that. So I also put a curve here. This is right off Wikipedia, but uh, you can find it anywhere. And of course, this is taken from uh, 2018, so a bit outdated now. But the reason why is just this is a very, very standard yield curve, okay? Um, and I'd also like to mention, uh, for sake of being pedantic, I noticed a lot of people, and I mean, to be honest, look, I shouldn't be pedantic about this, but if you want to understand the jargon, at least in the US market, there is a difference between the T-bills, the notes, and the bonds. Okay, so T-bills are anything under one-year bonds. Okay, so they're actually bills. Okay, the T-bills uh, and the notes are anything between the two-year and the 10-year. Okay, the cash. And the, and the bonds or anything from 20 years plus, just to be a bit pedantic and whatever. But and, and of course, each country has their own different a bit of lingo describing it. For example, I believe the equivalent, the German equivalent of the T-bills is like boo bills or something, I think, if I'm not mispronouncing it. Um, so th that's what you describe. But anyway, let, let's just say generically bonds in the stream. But if any of you guys are wondering what the hell is a T-bill, a T-note or T-bond, it's just talking about the maturities, okay? So the notes is in the two year to 10 year. The T-bills is one year, uh, you know, less than a year. Uh, and then 20 plus years is the bonds. Um, and, and yeah, so here we have our general, um, you know, yield curve and so on. And as I was saying before is if, for example, we have, you know, let's say the long end is rising relatively faster than the short end, for example, like this, then you have like a steepening effect, okay? And, and that's, that's all there is to it. I'll come back to this kind of in a second, but there's nothing scary, nothing that complicated, as I once thought, really about, um, you know, the yield curve. It can be very simple. It's nothing. The, the, a lot of, uh, you know, journalistic pieces, a lot of news pieces love to overcomplicate it, but uh, it's generally quite simple. Okay. So now let's talk about quickly how the bond. So if I, if I go back to um, this section here, the current market price, the market value. So very simply just, you know, markets going up and down every day. How do they price the bonds? You know, why do they go up and down? And this is very important. This is going to be um, uh, very relevant to us. Okay, so if you guys, um, I mean, again, if you've been following Axia for, uh, you know, for, for, uh, for quite a while, you should know very well the fact that one, you know, one big edge we trade is central banks. So central bank events and whatever, and you know that's a that's a very you know a very strong edge for the team. And um, and as a side note, by the way, if, if you guys want to understand more about central banks and uh, everything so else, I highly recommend if if you don't have already the Axia Premium Stream um, subscription. Every time we have a central bank meeting, Bank of England, uh, ECB, uh, FOMC, whatever, Richard does a very a very nice uh, and extremely tradable debrief and uh preview of all of these events okay and i'm going to segue into that a bit later so there's more central bank stuff coming up guys but i just want to say that uh, he does a lot of them you know every month or every time we have those meetings and um that is at a at, sort of at the core at the center of uh, us as traders of trading that okay so this kind of here this these this section here you know if you're a trader at axia and everything you have to be very, very, uh, you should know all, you know, everything on here and more. Like I haven't listed, I haven't listed everything here so far, but um, we're going to segue into it. Okay. And for those guys also wondering, if you guys are thinking, okay, bonds are very cool. I want to trade them. I also want to trade them over, um, you know, central banks and everything, but I'm still not sure beyond just watching our, you know, the YouTube stream and whatever. There's also, for those guys of you not aware, a, also a, central bank trading course as well, 
you know, offered by Axia, sort of, I think, I think the very first central bank course, really by any sort of, uh, you know, prop desk or whatever, highly recommend it to you guys. I'll put it in the chat right now, uh, if you guys want to see the link. Um, <clears throat> here we go. So if you guys are very interested in that, I highly recommend you, f you follow that essential bank course. And this, you know, what I'm telling you is going to serve as a very, very beautiful underpinning to understanding all that's in here. Um, so that's, you know, the, the, the sort of course uh, leading into, into building that. So I'll just put that back. Cool. So let me now let's, let's talk about bond pricing and risk. So one thing you should, you should understand is, and I think someone may have actually mentioned it here. If I quickly look through the chat, someone said about nearer term risk, I think. Uh, okay, so um, we'll discuss it anyway. So duration. So as I mentioned, there is duration risk because if we're talking it's something about a two-year bond, uh, okay, let's be, let's be pedantic. A two-year note, okay, and a 30-year bond. Intuitively, you might be thinking, hang on a minute, you can probably predict at a much better certainty what's going to happen to the economy and to the world in two years than you can in 30 years, okay? Very simply, it doesn't take a genius to figure that out. So what does that mean? That means it's very simply, there is more risk and volatility baked into the long-end bonds purely because you just don't know if you're going to be able to get paid out your full, uh, your full, um, you know, let, let's say, let's say you're, you're lending to a friend. It is likely that friend is going to live in, in two years from now and be able to pay you back. Then he's in 30 years. In 30 years, he might die and then he won't be able to pay you back. I know that sounds terrible, but just think about it intuitively. Okay, so in the same way, a country's fortunes, a country's economy, a country's outlook may change very, very dramatically in 30 years, okay? And so there's always a risk in duration. So many, many more things can happen in two years from now, in five years from now, in 10 years from now. And what if you become more fearful that you can't actually get your... Um, yeah, so if he, uh, if he eats organic, he, he is more credit worthy. So he's going to get uh, better rates, uh, Satoshi. But anyway, so... Okay, so there is a duration risk in that sense. And actually, one time we, all of you may have seen this, but I'm not sure if you may have been aware, is during the pandemic last year, I think it was about in, in March, or well, obviously, the Mar obviously it was in March, but uh, I think leading into summer, one thing we did see is duration risk repricing, where, in, you know, I'll mention, well, I will jump around here a bit, but sorry, not this, the safe haven. All of you should know now, if you've watched the previous streams, and if you haven't, I highly recommend that you do, obviously, uh, talking about risk on and off flow. But as we all know, in risk, uh, risk off environments, all the bonds, all the bonds, uh, generally, especially intraday, it doesn't matter, don't overthink it, all in risk off environments of safe haven flow, all the bonds get bid. They are bought, okay, as alternative to holding stocks or other uh, risky assets, safe havens, the bonds being one of them, gets bought, okay? So all the bonds get bought in that kind of sense. But if things get really, really, really bad, like really bad, like pandemic level bad, okay? Not just a Trump tweet, but pandemic level economy, future changing bad, you might have duration repricing where you might actually see the long end. So let's say you have the 10 year, and, and this is what we saw. I remember very, very distinctly. You had the 10 year and the 30 year suddenly, the bid in the 10-year and the 30-year, or it won't even bid, it might stay flat or even offer slightly, you, you, you'll see how the market's so unwilling to, uh, to pick those up. And all of a sudden, the short end, the two and the five years, uh, let, let's say the two years, are super hyper bid, okay? And why is that? That's because those, the big pension funds are real money, okay? The billions and billions, they're actually rotating out of long end duration and into short end. And if things get even more ridiculous, even even two years, just ridiculous, like, you know, safety, we might even have a uh, duration risk into into money markets. OK, money markets thing, you know, being things like, um, um, uh, you know, you know uh, T-bills or any any of that sort. So anything with one year or less. OK, so, so this is very rare. This will only really happen in like crazy, crazy environments. But that is a, a problem because okay, so you have to be faced with that reality. 
Uh, Satoshi, do I mean risk on and off instantly on a, a longer or a t a time frame? Both. So when I say this, it we should be thinking because we're tr intraday traders as you know the big flow of the one day when you have it. But generally, you will be able, you, you will oftentimes see persistent risk on and off flow when you know when people are actively repricing when when there's big market rotation in and out of asset classes. Uh, so. It, it is it is it is fractal as all things in markets you know so you, you'll see a one-day event and then you'll see like how things tail off into the week okay or into the month or whatever but that is a duration risk so that is one thing that prices the bonds okay um uh, up or down depending on what we're going for and now here's the big one and obviously none of you are going to be surprised by this if you have been following uh you know the new any financial news because everyone is talking about um inflation inflation all day long uh, but just generally for you to understand that uh, very intuitively, inflation does, uh, the reason why we care about inflation in, in, okay, this is oversimplifying, but the reason why we care is two things is because the bonds we're going to be talking about here is obviously dollar or any bond that you talk about has to be priced in a certain amount. So there might be dollars or there might be priced in euros or they might be priced in pounds or whatever. It is always priced in currency, but just keeping with our US treasuries, they're going to be priced in dollars. Obviously, if there's an inflationary problem in the economy, the amount that you're going to be paid for in 10 years, 15 years, 30 years or whatever is going to be eroded. OK, so the value is being eroded in those markets. So generally, you will have what you'll notice. This is why the long end is much more uh, if I do you know, long term bonds or long end. Are much more. Um, uh, sensitive to inflation uh, movements and this is why again if you guys want to understand a quick uh, mental shortcut is just always remember yields are positively correlated with inflation okay so they move together so generally if you pick up a uh, you know if you pick up a yield chart and an inflation chart you'll notice that yields uh, and inflation are positively correlated and what does that mean just by forget you know remembering what i told you is that bond prices, uh, when yields go up, uh, not that, in, not that uh, yields are going up, so bond prices are coming down. The bond prices are going down because of higher inflation, which gives higher yields. But that's the shortcut here, if you want to exit, you know, the quick shortcuts. But that means bond prices are going down, okay? <clears throat> and this is where we talk about, again, this is the, um, here, how, how you interpret uh, trading economic data, how you understand inflation, how you tie in, trading these in, in futures markets, inflation and everything, um, you know, it, it's the glue to making your strategy, which is, you know, very, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, at Axia and, and, and on the floor and a lot of the career program as well on how you actually actively trade these. And if you are, if you know, if you've gone through the program, you'll actively understand when that kind of data becomes uh, important to the economy. Okay. So in that case, the inflation, but also don't forget, this is where we're going to segue into uh, central banks. Okay. And I I'm going to, again, we, all of these things are all related. All of these things are basically related with each other. So I don't want to say they're separate, but we're going to come back to it. So, uh, you know, the, if you guys uh, know just one or two things about central banks, you know that the mandate, as Powell loves to say to every generic question, is that price stability, as in the control of inflation and unemployment, are the two key mandates for the FOMC. Okay. So FOMC being the US central bank, Okay, I wrote S, FOMC. Um, they've got to keep a handle on inflation at or above 2% and unemployment. Okay. Uh, unemployment, let's see that. By the way, the ECB, for those guys who don't get confused, the ECB doesn't uh, have a mandate to control unemployment. It has only a mandate to control inflation. And if you are the, you know, but that's the main thing, the inflation. But the FOMC is concerned about inflation and unemployment. So, the reason why we also care about inflation, and this is why inflation affects the short end as well, because people say, you know, the long end is much more sensitive, as I just explained, to interest, uh, to, uh, to um, inflation. But, it, you know, the whole curve is sensitive. Why? Because inflation is going to give a uh, lead onto what interest rates do. OK, so very simply, if, interest, if, if inflation um, uh, keeps going up, the only real tool, the well, okay, real of the official tool the central banks have to control inflation is through interest rates, uh, or shall I say specifically the federal funds rate. So I'll just say the Fed funds 
rate. So without diving into that too much, um, the Fed funds rate, uh, that, that basically changes the, the rate of overnight borrowing, make it more expensive to borrow or cheaper to borrow, depending if it goes up or down. But generally, they make it more expensive to borrow. Uh, so if the Fed funds rate goes up, it will try to pull back to try and eat away at inflation to then lower inflation. Okay, But then that's when the, the Fed may start a normalization or a hiking cycle to go up. And this is when we segue into all of these things, into into the, um, you know, into uh, Fed, central banks, bonds and everything. And this is why as well, guys, as a little um, uh, favor to me, if while you guys are watching this right now, one thing I've been, um, uh, where is my thingy? Let's see. So one thing I've been working on is uh, actually making, actually writing an internal Axia handbook for bonds and rates. Okay, so just generally, you know, when we have the new guys come up to me and they say, hey, I don't get this. Can you tell me? I'm going to say, read the book so I can be a bit lazier. But no, but, uh, you know, th this segues into how you tie all of these things together. And what, I, what I'm sort of giving you a sneak peek at here is uh, one, one of my little pet projects here, the, the sort of the internal sort of Axia handbook which hopefully is going to become sort of like, you know, a key part of, uh, you know, the courses or, you know, learning and everything. So because, again, usually a, tr a trader we're trying to develop at Axia is someone who's multidimensional and holistic in understanding so many different kinds of, um, you know, he, understand, he has, understands all asset classes. He's very competent at trading any, any asset class. All of the senior guys at Axia, are, even, no matter how they trade, what they trade, whatever, They'll all understand all of the asset classes, all asset class fundamentals. And I'll tell you right now, what I'll tell you right now is they are extremely competent, extremely good, and not only trading central banks, but anything to do with bonds. Okay, so they know this inside out. And, uh, you know, this is what we're trying to develop on the floor. And I think one key thing is just knowing what's one plus one. So <clears throat> I'll, I'll give you, I'm giving you guys a sneak preview of this kind of thing. And this is where I want to segment. So... If you guys have any ideas, perhaps if the, you know, if the if the handbook ever makes it to you guys through perhaps you know one of the Axia courses or if you join Axia or anything, uh, you'll have a video. So if you guys tell me anything I'm missing out from here, I've I've only just written this like you know, on, on, on let's say tissue paper kind of like for five minutes, like just off the top of my head. But you can see here like the kind of thinking that goes into it, of you know of what's important or not. So of course you know we talked about the bond price and the yield relationship. Uh, the cash, cash markets versus futures. Actually, I'll bring that up. I uh, haven't fully fleshed that out. Um, <clears throat> and so on. We talked about pricing risk and we talked about the curve, the maturity and yields. I've talked about key terminology and everything. And then hopefully I'll get to you guys just so you understand my plan for the stream to the stir market short term interest rates and won't spend too much time and the central banks. But I'm telling you now, again, multifaceted holistic traders and this is the same way we're going to build out build out and bulk it out for the same you know for the new generation of guys that come through uh in my opinion so hopefully that pet project will take off sooner rather than later okay so <clears throat> let's quickly fly through that okay so they you know they, they adjust the fed's funds fed funds rate to fight inflation and that will just generally move the when they adjust the fed's fund rates that will move the short end because you can just this isn't everything to do with the short end, but the short end is much more sensitive to interest rate changes. So short end interest rate changes. Now, be very careful here. When someone tells you, you know, the, the, the long end is more sensitive to inflation, to economic growth, to credit worthiness, that's all true. But, and the short end is more sensitive to interest rates, that's all true. But I'm telling you now, all the bonds are sensitive to interest rate changes. They're all sensitive to inflation. So is the short end because inflation and interest rates, they're all linked. Everything here is linked all in one circle. It's just depending on when one plays into the other. It's like, you know, like a, a reflexive circle to quote, um, you know, re reflexivity uh, to quote George Soros. Um, the guy who wrote the book, not the guy with the username in the chat, I think, um, if you see here today. But anyway, so... That's how we can uh, understand that sort of uh, side. But as a mental note, generally is, uh, you know, short end more like interest rate based and inflation economic growth for the long end. 
And here's so we can understand bonds, and I'll try and change my color a bit just so you guys don't get lost here. So I'll change this in blue. So we discussed interest rates and now credit worthiness. I'm sure this will make a lot of sense, but let me move to here. Uh, actually, let's let's uh, put it more on the left. So if you're going to lend money, everyone does this intuitively, as I said, uh, you're much, you know, if you're going to lend money to someone, you're going to want to lend it to someone reliable, someone who can realistically pay you back in, in the form. You know, if you take out a mortgage, if you want to borrow money, there's all of these factors that go into it. Uh, everyone should be kind of familiar to an extent or, or something else. But when we discuss the credit worthiness of a country, you usually have uh, the, a credit rating attached to them. Um, you know, uh, several uh, credit rating agencies like Moody's or uh, uh, S&P or whatever, and they give a credit rating everything from like, uh, I forgot exactly what they are, they're like AAA or, um, or uh, I don't know, like... Uh, a plus or whatever or something like that but anyway that's like the highest credit quality you can get and then it goes into like a b or whatever and then you go into like junk bond territory and like uh, c's or b minus or whatever it was but there's a sliding scale as you can imagine as you could figure out very intuitively because all uh, there's you know there's countries up here in the extremely high quality credit rating which is basically the us uh and, and germany um which, by the way, I saw someone talking about the 10-year, is why, for example, uh, the risk-free rate judged by finance professionals, the risk-free rate, which all capital asset pricing mod modules, um, you know, anyone who's done finance here, you'll, heard of, you'll hear of the term, the risk-free rate, you know, mortgage rates. They're all based off something. The universe has collectively decided the US 10-year rate is for, for the, the risk-free rate in the world, uh, if that's true or honest. Okay. Um, if that's true or not, it doesn't matter. And of course, in the European equivalent is probably Germany, um, uh, really. And then you have, you know, a lot of Western uh, economies and so on. And as you go down the credit quality, you know, um, you, you have different countries. And a lot of things that affect credit worthiness is things like politics, is things like um, economy. And again, very intuitive. Why? Because... Uh, what if a what if uh, a, 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 the country goes on a huge, you know, let's say a very left leaning uh, party gets into a country and they love to spend, okay, uh, as as uh, you know they love to spend like crazy, and what's that going to mean? If they're going to spend without taxing more, they're going to have to borrow more. Borrowing more means they're going to have to issue debt. OK, if they're going to have to issue more debt, that they're going to do that by selling more bonds. OK, they're going to put more bonds into the market. OK, so the bond supply. This is when you can use any sort of market knowledge, like let's say oil supply is going up. Therefore, the oil price of oil goes down the same way as if bond supply goes up, the bond prices go down. OK, same thing. So, <clears throat> uh, you know, that's another thing like, you know, and then therefore we could say the credit worthiness goes down because also their ability to now finance to pay you back, maybe, depending what country you're talking about, if they're spending like crazy, like let's say, you know, you gave your friend a hundred dollars, uh, okay, let's, let's change, you gave your friend $3,000 and that guy spent the $3,000 in one go. He took out all of his life savings to spend, 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 and he's broke. Well, all of, all of a sudden, the chances for him to be able to pay you back has just gone down massively. So that affects his credit worthiness, okay? So that's when we think about credit worthiness, the ability to pay it back. But that can also be different things. Like, let's say the economy, uh, a country's economy, um, has been trashed because of various reasons, okay, for uh, financial crashes, uh, uh, you know, problems like that. Uh, and, and, you know, this is how the uh, South and European economies brutally found out that, uh, you know, in, in their bond markets that, um, you know, their ability to pay back those bonds, the, the investors lost confidence that they can actually pay it back. So if the economy, if the economic fortunes of that country goes down, the long end uh, market uh, prices also go down. OK, um, and, and, and that makes sense. So I see a Greece. Yeah. So all the South and European economies, not just them. I, I, don't, I don't want to pick on them because I have to say the Greeks for anyone out there. You guys have done really well. You guys have cleaned up because you now uh, uh, you're now locked in like crazy tiny rates. And uh, your your bond markets recovered massively, so props to you guys. Don't wanna, you know, I don't wanna 
you guys have done really well out of that. So, uh, you know, through all, all that hardship that um, occurred so long ago. But anyway, yes. So, you know, so that's, uh, you know, that considers the economic fortunes. And this now we can segue into something where we can talk about uh, different sovereign bonds. So let's talk about, um, I'm just thinking now how, how my, what's the cleanest way I can give it to you guys now, uh, just to think. Okay, so, okay, let, uh, I'll bring this in. So this is when we can look at different yields of different countries. Okay, so let's say we've got the German yields, uh, German yields, We'll leave the US out for now. Let's talk about European bonds for now. German yields and Italian. Okay, so what you'll notice is that much of the uh, German yields have now been, you know, negative for quite a long time or, you know, at zero or just slightly above zero. So very flat in and around zero. And the Italian ones uh, up until, okay, up until recently, they're also you now getting closer to this. Or I think, I think the long end, uh, the long end Italian trade above, uh, below zero at one point or something. But, um, Anyway, generally there is uh, what you'll notice, or let's just say Southern European, is that this will trade at a risk premium, like a higher yield. Let's let's just make it up. Let's say three uh, percent. It should be higher than this, but let's just say that. This is when different sovereign uh, yields uh, trade differently because of the baked-in risks that you might have in a Southern European economy being able to pay you back in the future. Uh, compared to the, the market belief that the German, uh, uh, you know, treasury can pay you back in the future. Okay, so it's all about the belief that the German, um, the German treasury can pay you back better in 10 years than the Southern European uh, countries can in 10 years. Okay, so this is why they can borrow cheaper relative to because the credit, the credit worthiness in, uh, you know, of the German economy and in the German treasury is much higher is much better than you know in the southern one and this is where you just generally end up with the spread and this is where we end up talking about the uh, you know like different spreads like the the bund the german tenure and the italian tenure uh btps uh just realized i've been writing sideways this whole time but uh, i think you guys can see that anyway uh, and, and, and that forms a spread, okay? And that can tell you a lot of like uh, market thinking, a lot of market implications. And we're going to come back to spreads in a minute because I know I think if you guys are eager to talk about spreads but um, or, or from the economic sense. Um, and this is the thing. Again, I bring up the Axia and, 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 and I think I may not have it here, but uh, let me see. So for you guys who have been watching, uh, you know, one of the elite traders trade on... Um, yeah, news, you know, the, the macro trader, um, them, uh, but all of the guys, you know, everyone trades it here, but he, the only reason I'm bringing him up is because, you know, we have a lot of his recordings, uh, on, on the Axia YouTube site. So if you guys search on the Axia YouTube site, anything to do with BTPs, you'll see him trading this, this news, the Bund BTP spread, or he's not trading the spread, but he's trading the outrights based on what the Bund BTP spread is doing. Okay. So this is why, uh, I think someone mentioned why why do you need to know all this why do you not trade off footprint why do you not trade off flow a hundred percent you can but the reason the, the the thing you're trying to build into is to a professional trader is you're being a holistic multifaceted multi-dimensional trader that understands all of these economic relationships because there is one core foundational leg to your trading okay a guy who will be able to tell you everything about the bonds will also be able to tell you everything about Technicals, also about footprints, also about order flow. There is no weakness, okay? But one persistent weakness is obviously fundamentals, and this is why we're covering on this. But yeah, if you guys search on the YouTube page, uh, uh, Elite Trader BTPs, you'll see him trading this event. Because usually there is something scaring the market to sell the Italian BTPs and buy buns, okay? And this is where uh, we can talk about repricing in credit worthiness, where... Um, uh, you know, where peripheral bonds or like, or like uh, lower rated uh, credit worthiness bonds. So if I type in peripheral, I think my pen is um, acting strange, peripheral, perif and core. So, you know, when people say, hey, the, um, as Fox Trader said very exactly, uh, you need to know how big the opportunity is exactly. So, for example, the market might deem, you know, Southern, uh, 
uh, European bonds peripheral and the core like the Germans and uh, you know those move differently as well so it's understanding the market if you're if you're BTP trader you need to understand that your market is something deemed a peripheral a lot of the time compared to the core and that has its own implications coming all the way back to this um, you know this here and I think since I've, I've squiggled so much I'm gonna quickly just copy and paste this uh, here just so we have more space okay so again, I'm jumping around something, but we're going to tie it very, very beautifully towards the end. Okay, so this is where is is very nuanced, guys. If we look at bonds and we say, hey, bonds are a safe haven. Yes, you will see the Bund go up on safe haven flow, the market wanting safe haven assets, and the market will also buy BTPs, the Italian 10-year, because that's also a safe haven. But if you have localized news, okay, you will... Um, see the BTP is being affected because of localized Italian news. So keep that in mind, okay? And then, as I said, uh, in terms of other bond pricings, you have demand and supply uh, affecting it because remember the, the uh, FOMC, uh, central banks, they can all affect the short end through uh, uh, open market operations, okay? So when they come in and they buy short end bonds, long end bonds, and by the way, that's also how we can also talk about yield curve control. For those wondering what yield curve control is, instead of the central bank buying uh, a two-year uh, sort of short-end um, uh, instruments uh, to control rates, they can also go further down the, down the curve to, let's say, buy up all the 10-year bonds and lock in a certain yield and just say, we're not, we're not letting it go past a certain yield. Okay, so that's, that's in 30 seconds what yield curve, curve control is. So that's an open, open market operation. Okay, so... Um, and as I said here, uh, you know, you have the central bank controlling like the short end. They can very much diligently control control it on that side. Okay, so <clears throat> let me see if it's written a lot here. Okay, so one last thing I want to talk about. So again, this is this is one thing I'm going to bring into the handbook. So if you guys let me know anything else, I think that would be useful for you guys to come in here is uh, something to do with spreads. Okay, so. <clears throat> Very simply, if the tenure, uh, what spread should we use? Let's use the choose tens. So if you have all the cool guys on Twitter talking about, hey, I'm trading choose tens, or if a trader tells you, hey, look at the choose tens or whatever, what they mean is, if I write this, choose tens, it means that's the spread between the two-year rate, uh, two-year yield. It can be the futures, but usually they mean the two-year yield and the ten-year yield. Okay, um, and and let's say the the two-year has uh, I don't know. Let, let's just make it up one percent yield, and the ten-year has three. So the choose ten spread is just basically you know this minus this. So the spread is going to be two percent, and that can go up or down. And generally, what's accepted in the financial industry. Um, so far that's um, accepted in the industry is um, the choose tens is basically what they call the curve, like curve shifting. So when they say the curve is flattening or the curve is, 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 is steepening, they will say, um, you know, they would look at the choose tens. You can also do it like, you know, fives, thirties, uh, I don't know, choose thirties, whatever, but generally it's the, you know, it's the choose tens. And that literally can be its own chart. So, you know, it will move move like any sort of chart that you'll see. You know, it'll have its breakout. It's like, uh, you know, range, breakout, whatever. And just generally when you see it, if you remember, if it when it goes up, that means it's widening or steepening. And when it goes down, it goes uh, narrowing and flattening. And again, I, I don't want to get too much into detail how you'd be trading. Uh, you know, I, I, as I mentioned, if you guys are joining later, uh, hopefully we're going to have Alex. Uh, for those of you who don't know Alex, you know, one of the co-founders at Axia, he's traded, he's seen a lot of these effects on the market of these uh, of these yield movements, yield curve movements, and how you can trade them. And he'll hopefully come on on another stream and discuss that. But for anyone on the trading floor, part of Axia, part of the group, part of you know various training modules, um, as I said, the central bank training module um, uh, course uh, available on the website. 
you'll be going through this where you can understand how these shifts in the curve can affect different markets. Okay, so that's the meat and bones when, uh, you know, in, in very, very detail of, of when you'd be trading it. Okay, so, um, and then one last spread I would like to also mention is, as I alluded to earlier, is things like, uh, you know, uh, Bund's uh, BTP spreads and things like that to understand, like to, to basically give you, uh, you know, core versus uh, peripheral or, you know, uh, uh, creditworthiness spreads and so on between different countries and so on. But again, I, I, uh, I highly recommend if you guys want to understand how that works, just as I said, check out the, um, the YouTube videos of them trading that the elite trader trading BTPs uh, on elections or whatever. Okay, so <clears throat> one last thing I'd like to mention is uh, two things. One thing you should be aware of is this for those guys uh, looking at is the short term interest rates and central banks. So uh, if we're talking about the short term rates where you can, you should be know something about the LIBOR, something that's going to be changed in the next few years, but that's the London uh, interbank offered rate. I'm not going to get into all this crazy detail again. It's in the central bank course. So please check that out if you guys really want to want to get your teeth into that. But essentially, that's the that's the um, Again, I'm going to skip over so much detail here, but it's the 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 rate at which banks, uh, private banks, are exchanging between each other, the interest rates they are charging to shift money in and out uh, from overnight or three months from now. Okay, so that's between banks themselves, and and a lot of the short-term interest rates, the stirs, are markets like the euro dollars. So you guys got futures of this that are priced as 100 minus LIBOR. And again, I don't want to get too much into that, but uh, that basically gives you the interest rate expectations so you understand how the curve shifts. So if you pull up your futures ladder and you type in either GE or uh, depending on the software using GE or I think uh, ED and you put in something like uh, GE December, uh, so Z or... Uh, G E U and you put in like 23 then that's going to give you a certain price maybe someone could tell me what that price is right now but whatever that price is let's I'm going to completely make it up uh it's, it's not going to be the price but let's say it's 97 what you now know is the fact that that uh you know um that uh, being 97 as I said 100 minus LIBOR but we can make we can transform that LIBOR into an into an x uh you know, and here we have the euro dollars. What we can say X is basically what the market is thinking, what the interest rate will be for that economy in uh, September 2023. Again, so for example, if the market thinks, uh, you know, in September 2023, we think, uh, 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 you know, X is basically 3%. And that gives you then another curve, the Ford curve of the short term interest rate markets. Okay, so like money market products, overnight financing and all that. So just so you're aware, that's a thing that exists in the markets as a tradable product for those guys who don't have any experience with that. Okay. And then we can arrive quickly at central banks because uh, I think I want to do a lot of Q&A at the end. So guys, start revving up your Q&A. Yeah, get them in now if you'd like. Uh, just type them up. Uh, just I'll be sort of landing the airplane here quickly. Is <clears throat> um, sort of central bank expectations because then all of this you know, when you can look at these markets, this will give you central bank expectations. The central banks do do talk about the, uh, you know, bond pricing and how they reprice the bonds and so on. That's a very hot topic as well. And, um, yeah, and, 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 you know, one other thing is in here, I'll just put that here. Sorry for the guys who might be getting lost in this, but you, you can replay the, uh, the video is uh, one thing you should be aware of is when banks are hawkish and dovish. Now, again, since I want to land the stream here, one thing I will tell you guys to check out is um, beyond the central bank course, I want you guys to also check out on our blog. I will put the link in the chat. There we go. If you guys can see that. <clears throat> So here's a uh, so this is this is what uh, Richard does in a video form for the Axio Premium subscribers. So, you, so for you guys who know that, you should. Um, oh, I think maybe 
the guys on YouTube, tell me if you received that. I think you may not have, my software is telling me you probably didn't get the link. So tell me if you guys did. So this is what Richard does on his, um, you know, on the, on the premium live stream. They're very, very good. So if you guys follow that link and go to the blog, you can sort of see how, you know, from the market prop world, how we at Axia trade these kind of events, how we're thinking about it, how we all tie it together, because that's really when the meat comes in. And you can see how, you know, we look about uh, expectations, uh, absorbing information, how the bonds move, the BTPs, the bonds, um, you know, trading lessons and so on. So uh, you guys should really check that out because then you can start to understand the lingo. So this is where I'm going to come in and say, you guys should also be doing your homework. And hopefully I've, I've, I've gave you guys enough of a base to sort of really understand, you know, doing homework on PEP and understanding all that. But really, as I said, you know, we do do a course on it and that should all tie it very neatly together for those who are like, you know, see all this and you go, oh my God, you know, this is like too much and so on. So I highly recommend doing that. And of course, this, the career program also ties that in very nicely. The, the six week flagship career program as well. Okay, so that, that's that there. I hope you guys have it uh, in there. So um, one last thing, because I know you guys sometimes ask me, is the hawkish and dovish uh, flow? But that just generally means, um, do we raise rates sooner to accommodate for economic data? data? So let's say, let's stick to the FMC. Does the Fed funds rate have a higher chance of going higher sooner rather than later because of hawk because of members of the FMC talking hawkishly or acting hawkishly or dovishly do the Fed's fun Fed funds rate stay flatter lower for longer and so on based on economic data and then all the markets will move the S&P the dollar will move on hawkish and dovish flow but since we're talking only about bonds what you'll just generally have as a as a quick uh, cheat sheet shall we see shall we say because this is the main thing I want you guys to take away is generally, but not always, depending on what's been priced in. Uh, hawkishness means we might raise rates faster. So rates, uh, interest rates higher. What that means, bond yields follow. Yes, Corey, it is actually Richard who does the central banks course. So Richard does both the career course and he also does the um, the central bank one as well. Yeah, so it's, it's all by, done by Richard and um, what I love about it is because he also comes from, you know, from the old guard that, you know, uh, you know, back from his days when they're all trading this out of 2008. So Richard has like ridiculous historical experience. He, you know, he was trading. If you guys watch the in the interview I did with Richard, he talks about how he was trading and he did, you know, very good career career making days on on 2008 interest rate cuts or 2008 uh, uh, on on Operation Twist and all that and and everything. I think you know, doing both the ups and downs of trading it. Um, so he's someone who's, you know, fantastic to trade trade that because he's got like the the, the historical depth of, of, of teaching all these kind of instances. And it's also him, by the way, who writes these, uh, who does the prep and also writes these blogs here, uh, if you guys can see. So just remember interest rates, you know, if we price in that the interest rates go higher, uh, Cetris Paribus, to use that um, annoying economics term, interest rates go higher. Bond yields go higher, which means as us who trade the futures, uh, bond futures. Uh, futures go down and, you know, if, if we're saying dovish or like this surprise dovishness and we think, OK, interest rates will be lower or flat. Let's say they, we think the interest rates will be lower for longer then generally bond yields will also follow longer the same way and bond futures. Um, also go up. Okay, so Corey, that's great. I'm very, very glad you enjoyed the career course. And yes, central bank course all the way is very, very good. And as I said, that's that's a beautiful edge we all have at Axia to trade. I'm also a big fan of trading them uh, as well. Uh, you know, and I'm I'm also very you know for those who may not have watched the other streams, I'm also very bond centric myself as a trader uh, trading those you know as opposed to other asset classes. So this is why you know hopefully I can I can talk to you guys about this. Um, so that's, that's a very, very, this is not everything here. That's a very brief interlude to understanding that kind of thing. So I think I, I touched us down nicely. I think I've sort of landed the plane. Hopefully we got through a hell of a lot. So hopefully you guys can review this stream because what I really wanted to keep this stream at is, you know, at is, is, is cutting a few corners, but making it very efficient for us as intraday futures traders, as flow traders and understanding where we from Axia, from our mentality approach it. Yeah, you know, to take it in this sort of direction. 
So uh, I'm going to quickly go through, I think I saw some questions from much earlier on. And while I scroll through, send me any questions you guys want, like anything we've been doing. Well, when I say anything, hopefully on topic, just because a lot of other topics I'm sure we're going to get through, uh, we've, I've either done before or how we'll do in the future. So anything to do with, you know, bonds or how we trade our Axie and everything. And I will, um, we will go through that. So let me just go through your chat. Okay, so from Fox Trader, we have um, we have this question. Uh, in fact, I'll pull it up right here. See if he's um, uh, uh, here. We go. So, will you cover how? Okay, so very very good question. And then actually, this is probably one last thing I should mention. Will you cover how the futures price the ten year on my ladder is priced at this price, one three one point six three, but the dollar price of the ten year is this. Perfect. Uh, yeah, very good question. So this is where we trade between. Um, the uh, the bond futures pricing and the cash. So what what uh, Fox Trader meant by the ten year change color now? What he talked about in the ten year uh, being uh, priced at eighty nine point two eight. That's the par value, okay, or close to the notional value. And the futures, why it's priced at the futures at let's say one point three one six three. <clears throat> Is because the futures, so the futures were trading, and this is very important, guys. I really hope you can take this home. Remember, the futures we're looking at is a basket of deliverable bonds at the end of when that futures expires. So, for example, if you're trading the September SEP 21 bonds, the 10 year, what that means is if you hold that future to expiry in September 21, you'll be delivered a basket of anything between five, I think, to like uh nine years so actually the way the the 10 years composed on this on the on the chicago board of trade the cbot is actually not really a 10 year it's a basket of different maturities of five to nine years okay and this is why it has become very popular to look at the ultra tense ultra tense in fact it may not even be nine years i think it's like eight or seven years and the ultra tense are very much tighter closer to the actual real uh you know to to, to it delivers bonds closer to that maturity as well, or the ultra 30s and so on. Um, so that is also one reason. But the other reasons is the way the way it's a bit more complicated. The way the you know the futures work in terms of like discount of cash flows and whatever. But just generally, that's um, and there's a whole crazy mathematics formula where you can derive the futures uh, price into the yield. But uh, that that's the one thing you can just Google and have a you know Excel sheet for uh, because you know there's no point talking into that. But it's just a lot of like the way the prices are, you know, shown on your ladder and whatever. Um, and the futures price is not like as significant as I would say compared to uh, the yield or par value uh, and th and things like that. So just as just to just to notice. Cool. Um, I see someone talking about the euro dollar and euro dollar spreads. I would love to talk about that perhaps in another stream, just because I think I dumped through the kitchen sink at everyone here. Uh, so I believe this, no more, few, I, I've answered some of the questions I think from earlier as well. So I think that's it guys. I kept that I think nice and sweet. I hope you guys understood that. For, the, for those guys, you know, again, if you're more interested, if you want to understand how do we tie in one of our fundamental understanding of, of um, central banks, how do we tie in, uh, you know, technicals with this are the tools we use how do we approach it and for you guys you know haven't attended it then i really really do recommend that you go to this link here you've seen it showing up in the chat elitetraderworkshop.com from someone from the team uh, someone from the senior team will be there to give you you know free training on much more in detail here and i really recommend for you guys to check that out cool so i hope that was a nice stream for you guys i'll be wrapping it up now have a very nice evening a nice sunday or I think even a very nice early afternoon if you're um, from the Pacific end. Uh, and hopefully, yeah, we'll get through a few more stuff, uh, you know, a few more of the submitted questions. Perhaps we'll do something on Footprint first. We'll have Alex uh, come in on to discuss more, you know, bond-related stuff in due course, more interviews and all that fun stuff. So thanks so much, guys, for sticking it through. And uh, I'll see you guys shortly, perhaps not next weekend because that's Easter Sunday. So I think we'll be taking a break there, guys. So don't worry, there will not be a stream next week because of Easter Sunday, but we'll be back again in two weeks time, the week after Easter. Cool, I'll see you guys. See you guys in two weeks. Thank you very much.
If you find this video interesting, if you want to go deep into the Axia training method and how a trading team of seven figure traders develop setups and strategies and how they learn to build the most profitable trades across all market environments, then join me in this workshop. Now in this workshop, you're going to learn three powerful steps we use to train all our traders on both our London and our Poland trading desks to help build incredible levels of consistency. How to predictably understand which setups work and which don't. You're going to learn our two main strategies for how we perfect our trade timing before we enter every single trade. You're going to learn the VEL concept which is our one and only technique we use to leverage our largest trades. You'll also learn how to avoid trading setups that don't work, how to avoid those large losses, and our main method we use to identify them that saves our traders significant amounts of capital. Finally, you will learn how our traders use the power of network learning to find market patterns quicker than ever before, so you shortcut that learning curve. In the workshop, we want to program your awareness of elite performance, to program your ability to choose the right setups, and program your ability to be a consistent trader. So the trades that you execute become more simple and clearer. And I can tell you this, you'll never see the markets the same again. You'll never look at the markets with a narrow view of getting lost in all the noise and confusion. You'll take your first step towards a deep edge market awareness. I cannot wait for you to join me in this workshop. And I think you're in for a massive paradigm shift in your understanding of how to develop as a trader. So join me by clicking on the top right hand corner of the screen and sign up for this powerful training workshop or visit EliteTraderWorkshop.com.